Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Stacy, and I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is April the 25th of 2003, and I'm grateful to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to give my apologies in advance. I will have to leave the meeting promptly at the end of the hour because I am at work and have uh, people that depend on me. Uh, But I want to just thank you for the invitation. And had I have read the email correctly, I would have made sure that I made plenty of arrangements to be here for the entire meeting. That's not typical of me. And I believe in honoring the traditions of each group. Um, But again, I want to thank you for this opportunity. And it's nice to be back. It's nice to be back in the broken elevator. I've had my eye on this group for a while and hear about you guys from a group I used to attend the Bronx Big Book and just love what you all are doing and am privileged to be a part of it. So the topic that I'm talking about today is called Instincts Gone Awry. And um, when I was contacted to speak in this group, um, there's been a lot of activity in my life, which has... um, Well, it's been rather distracting. And uh, when uh, the individual reached out to me again and said, could you please come up with a topic? I came up with Instincts Gone Awry. And then they said, what a wonderful topic. And after I gave them the title of the topic, I thought, my God, what was I thinking? What do I have to say on this? But uh, uh, true to um, how God works in my life, uh, as soon as I gave the topic and thought about today, I have a lot to say. So that's how that works. Um, I have to tell you a little bit about me because I feel the need to just sort of give you some insight into um, who I was before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and really who I was well into my sobriety without God in the steps. Um, I will tell you that I'm a low bottom drunk. Those of you who have heard me talk before can attest to the fact that um, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was feral. And uh, that's just who I am without uh, divine intervention. Um, my alcoholic personality is as such that I don't need alcohol to burn my life to the ground. I'm actually really good at doing that drunk or sober on both sides of sponsorship, active in a home group with all the bells and whistles that Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer. You know, I am just so selfish and self-centered. And when I want my way, I'm so unprincipled about getting my way. And that seems to cause lots of trouble. And You know, when you are in Alcoholics Anonymous, on both sides of sponsorship, doing the work, active in a home group, and you are burning your life to the ground, it's very painful when you don't have the insulation of alcohol. When you don't have anything to change the way you feel and take away and numb the fact that one more time you've been fired, one more time you've burned a relationship to the ground, one more time you've been in a row with your siblings, you know, that's just not a comfortable place to be. But I've been there. I've been there. When the big book talks about lack of power being my dilemma, I understand that that's not just talking about drinking. Uh, lack of power in every area of my life. I don't know how to stop exercising the defects of character that I have. Prior to coming t- into AA and working the steps with a good sponsor, I wasn't armed with facts about myself. When I came here, if you asked me what my life was like, I would tell you things like everybody I ever loved has completely abandoned me. I didn't know that, you know, people don't like it when you lie to them and you cheat on them, right? Um, I had this belief system that if we were in a romantic relationship, you had to be endlessly supportive of my nonsense. It didn't matter what I brought to the table or what I failed to bring to the table. If you loved me, you would stay, and that's just the way it was. I didn't know that I was contributing to a lot of the misery in my life. I didn't have that understanding. It's not until I do a thorough fourth step with the help of a good sponsor, come to understand the nature of my defects of character. So I didn't have that. Now, prior to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had been arrested several times as a result of my drinking and my antics. Uh, I learned in AA, and thank God I learned this here. If you've been arrested more than three times, all you have to say is several. So I've been arrested several times. I've also been institutionalized several times. That is where I get me. I'd love to tell you that alcohol was the only thing that led me into a mental institution or led me to being arrested. I've actually been arrested sober too. 
Uh, I've also been institutionalized in times when I was trying not to drink. I didn't understand that thing that you talk about in the big book, those hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. All I knew is that when I wasn't drinking, I didn't feel okay. I had professionals that would tell me, Stacy, if you stop drinking, your life will get better. That's not my experience. When I stop drinking, my life gets worse. And so, you know, regardless of whether I'm drinking or whether I'm sober, life is unmanageable. Regardless of whether I'm drinking or whether I'm sober, I can destroy my life. That's just absolutely what happens to me. And so, you know, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I had um, I had inappropriate behavior here, you know, because I had worked uh, from age 17 to age 25 in the topless bar industry because I've been exposed to a very dark world. And because at 17 years old, I was doing things that other 17 year olds should not be doing for money. I developed. Um, a lot of survival instincts that I carried into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I came here, I wouldn't have told you they were survival instincts. I wouldn't have told you that it was a knee-jerk reaction to the way I showed up in life. What I would tell you is that I was a hustler. What I would tell you is that it was absolutely appropriate for me to show up into an AA meeting wearing a low-cut dress with no bra. Because, you know, I'm just a fashionista, right? And when I came into AA, I used to curse every other word. There used to be a sign on the wall in the meeting that I went to that said profanity is not a requirement for sobriety. And every time I talked, the old timers would point to the sign because I had no respect for the way you wanted me to behave. If I did something and it bothered you, I didn't care. I also came here egocentric, self-centered, and self-absorbed. The best definition of all of those three that I've heard that I appreciate the most came from Bob D, who said it's someone who makes decisions based on how they feel. I would show up when I said I was going to show up only if I felt like it. I would honor my commitments and honor my word only if it served me and there was nothing better else to do. And so naturally, when you come into any situation and you are self-will run riots, Uh, though I usually didn't think so. Everybody wanted to get away from me. But if you had asked me when I got here, what was the basic problem? I would tell you everybody that I ever loved abandoned me. And so, you know, I can't live in this skin comfortably as long as I continue to live the way I always have. That's important. And, you know, how does this have anything to do with alcoholism for my newcomers? You know, alcoholism doesn't cause, or let me put it this way. Alcohol doesn't cause alcoholism. Alcohol treats it. I have the kind of alcoholism that gets thirsty because I'm uncomfortable in my skin. The big book gives me great descriptive words. It says in full flight from reality, outright mental defective, right? Um, This is me on a good day. On a good day, I will destroy everything in my life only to come up out of the destruction and say, why is everybody being so mean to me when I'm the one who lit the match? And so because I live like that, I need a drink. And until my skin is comfortable, I will always crave a drink. And I have the kind of mind that will always rationalize my walk back to alcohol at all costs. If my skin gets uncomfortable enough, I'm going to have to do something about that. I'm either going to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of my intolerable situation by drinking myself to death. Or I'm going to buy a gun at the pawn shop because that's what people like I do. I've been sober in Alcoholics Anonymous long enough to understand that there are people in our rooms who make the supreme sacrifice. And that means they commit suicide rather than continue on this process. Every friend that I have so far that has taken their life took their life with long-term sobriety. And I understand why that happens. It doesn't just happen miraculously. It doesn't happen because one day the spouse up and left or I lost the job. Because I'll tell you, I've had all of those things happen since I've been here. What happens is I stop doing the work in Alcoholics Anonymous and my skin becomes uncomfortable again. And long before these people leave, long before the job fires me, long before I go into bankruptcy, I'm making decisions based on self and I have no clue that I'm doing it. They don't tell you what happens after the spiritual awakening, how the ego can rebuild itself. 
I didn't know that after I had that first flush of a spiritual awakening and felt good and just loved life and I was a part of a sense of community and wanted to help everybody in AA that I could, that eventually my mind would start to change. And when you guys would talk, I was no longer interested in what you had to say. When you all would ask me to go to H&I's, when you would ask me to carry the message, I had better things to do because I was making money. I didn't know that the ego would rebuild itself to where I couldn't listen to old timers talk because all I would hear in my head was na 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 na. What changed? I love these people. They saved my life in my early recovery. It was just my head that changed. I didn't know that I was going to have a constant battle with alcoholism throughout the course of my sobriety, and that it was essential that I would continue to embark upon a 12-step program of action in order to keep my perception where it needed to be. Because when my ego gets big enough, it's going to tell me to take a drink. When my ego gets big enough, it's going to convince me that it's okay to justify all kinds of egregious behaviors in my workplace, in my home life. I don't know about you all, but I got to a place in my sobriety where I love to burden the family that I so shockingly treated in my alcoholism, who readily accepted my amends and welcomed me with open arms. I think I was about four years sober when I started burdening myself to them to tell them how crazy I thought they were. And telling my sp- my sister, who's not sober, that she needed to get sober because we were all sick of her. When did I get this kind of attitude? When did I get this sense of like, I'm better than everybody else? Remind you, I'm a product of jails and institutions. I'm a product of the strip clubs. I was a commercial sex worker. When all of a sudden did I think I had cleaned up so well that I am better than you? It's because of that ego that continues to rebuild itself. And so that brings me to my topic. When I talk about instincts gone awry, I have to understand what it talks about in step four in the 12 and 12. And I'm not going to quote it because I don't have it memorized. But on page 42 of step four in the 12 and 12, it starts out by saying creation give us, gave us instincts for a purpose. Without them, we wouldn't be complete human beings. If men and women didn't exert themselves to be secure in their persons, made no effort to harvest food or construct shelter, there would be no survival. If they didn't produce, the earth wouldn't be populated. If there were no social instincts, if men cared nothing for the society of one another, there would be no society. So our desires for sex relation, for material and emotional security, and for companionship are necessary, perfectly necessary, and surely God-given. So. Before I read the next paragraph, let me comment on that. What it's telling me is that I was given these instincts by a power greater than myself. That when God created man and when he created me, he created me with desires because without those desires, I could not survive here. Of course, I need food. Of course, I need shelter. Of course, I need you to love me because if none of those things exist, I will cease to exist myself. So God gave me these instincts. These instincts are not bad. They are there for a purpose. What happens, though, which gives you the title of my um, topic, is that it seems like in someone like me, those instincts go awry. In the next paragraph, it says, yet these instincts, so necessary for our existence, often far exceed their proper functions, powerfully, blindly. Many times subtly, they drive us, dominate us, and insist upon ruling our lives. Our desire for sex, for material and emotional security, and for an important place in our society often tyrannize us. When thus out of joint, man's natural desires cause him great trouble. I love this next line. Practically all the trouble there is. No human being, however good, is exempt from these troubles. Nearly every serious emotional problem can be seen as a case of misdirected instinct. When that happens, our great natural assets, the instincts, have turned into physical and mental liabilities. Wow. So what it's telling me is no matter how long I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous, no matter how well I can quote this big book, no matter what my working knowledge is of the traditions, it doesn't matter how often I talk or how many workshops I've conducted here. It turns out in between workshops, in between service commitments, and in between commitments to my home group, I am still liable to want more than my share when it comes to sex, when it comes to material and emotional resources. What does that look like in my life? When it came to the desire for sex, um, for my sexual uh, instincts, um, I, I will tell you my first drug of choice was attention. 
I love getting attention and I don't really care who I get it from. I'll be honest with you. Um, that cost me a lot in my early sobriety because it turns out when you get attention from people who are in a matrimonial commitment to someone else, that is not a good thing. When I want uh, attention from coworkers, uh, from people in positions of power, and I love people in positions of power. If you're my supervisor, I'm going to try to overpower you in some way. And I will use every mm, instinct that I have to get you. You know, that has caused me a lot of turmoil. I had to actually leave a job because I was in a very inappropriate relationship with a boss at one point. And I was doing that with a home group, active with service commitment, sponsoring a lot of women at the time. So what else happens in my uh, pursuit of sexual desires? My gosh, when I was newly sober, I love to say that every person that I was in a, quote, romantic relationship with, uh, that I loved that person. Uh, one of the first definitions that I had to reconfigure and redefine in sobriety was the word love, because what I called love was something fundamentally different than what it's really meant to be. For example, um, years and years and years ago, before I even got sober, I was interested in this guy, right? And I was in a relationship at the time, but that doesn't matter. That's that's perfectly surmountable, right? And so I started actively pursuing this guy and he finally showed interest in me. And I won't tell you how I got his interest. That's not relevant, but you can just imagine uh, what someone with low self-esteem does to get in, to get attention from someone. And when I finally got his interest, I went and told the guy that I was seeing that I didn't want to date him anymore. And so I went to the man of my interest, right, my little romantic intrigue, and I told him, hey, I've broken up with my boyfriend and I'm now available. So if you want to start dating, I'm willing to date you. And he looked at me with this look of disgust, like, I can't believe you. You were seeing someone around the time that we did what we did. And I said, well, yeah, I hope that's not an issue. Like I said, I'm totally available now. And he proceeded to not return any of my phone calls. And so I would call him and I would call him and I would call him. I would even talk into back then we had answering machines. I would speak through his answering machine and I would offer things like Spurs tickets or, oh, hey, I've got these this ticket to this event. Call me back. Call me back. I'd love to have you know a date with you. Call me back. I'll be right here. I'll just wait by the phone until you call me back. I spent many Friday nights waiting on the phone for him to call me back and he never called me back. And I ended up feeling depressed. And so I was talking to a girlfriend of mine and I told her, I said, I think I'm in love with him. And she said, why do you think that you don't even know him? And I said, because I'm depressed. That must be love. You know, if I feel not so good when you're not around, in my mind, we're in love. Well, it turns out I was already depressed. I had untreated alcoholism, for God's sake. I only, The only time I didn't feel depressed is if I was actively pursuing someone or if I was drunk. And so that had nothing to do with him. That's my baseline. He just took away my depression because I'm like a moving target. I will focus on anything that changes the way I feel. And he just happened to be the subject at that time. So coming into sobriety, of course, everyone who gave me attention, I was in love with. And my sponsor used to jokingly say to me, would you love this person if they weren't giving you attention? Would you love them if they didn't have any money to spend on you? And the truth was, I would be like, absolutely not. I wouldn't even be in this situation. And I like to overlap people. I don't know about anybody else in here, but, you know, that's how you do jobs. You don't quit a job without one in the wings. And so I like to, you know, break up with someone because I've already got someone I'm pursuing. And so I love to overlap people because I love those relationships that give me butterflies, make me feel good about myself. That's what I'm always pursuing. And when the butterflies wear off, I no longer have interest in you. And so, of course, that is an, that is an absolute example of how instincts go awry. Never in any situation romantically have I ever, ever looked at how, what I could bring to the table. I was always looking at what I could take out. I also didn't understand the concept of like, oh, I don't know, um, maybe putting a little space in between dates. Because, you know, when people break up with me, I'm back on the market in like a week. You know, I'm already committed to someone else in like a week. So there was a lot of examples that I could see of how I wanted way more than my share. 
And every romantic relationship I was in was completely about me. It was never about the other person. I knew nothing about how to be a partner, how to be um, a worker among workers, a neighbor among neighbors. That was not the kind of um, demonstration that I had prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, when it talks about this material security that tyrannizes me, I can give great examples of that. I am highly materialistic. And what I mean by that is I want to have a lot of money. Uh, I remember listening to a speaker many years ago before I, when I was in my early sobriety, and he used to talk about being financially insecure. And he was an entertainment attorney in L.A., probably made about 32 million a year. And I used to laugh when I would hear him talk about being financially insecure. I thought, give me 32 million. See, don't I feel financially insecure? But the truth is someone asked him one day, they said, how much money do you think you need to not be financially insecure? And he thought about that. And he answered, and his answer was beautiful. He said, just enough that I don't have to trust God. And someone asked him, how much money is that? And he said, $10 more than I'll ever have. And when he said it, I got it. You know, the longer I've been sober, every year I make more money. In fact, currently I make more money than I've made in a long time. Um, Well, actually, I can't say that about this year. This year has been hard. But last year, that was kind of the trend. And last year when I was making more money than I had ever made, I was more financially insecure than I ever have been. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I lived in a halfway house. The cost of the rent was $300 a month, and I was on food stamps. I was on welfare, and I could barely make that rent. But, you know, I had never been more happy and more free in my life. Now, fast forward, I'm making 10 times that amount, and I'm not on welfare anymore, and I couldn't be, I couldn't be more afraid. You know, the reality of the situation is I want more money than what I'm entitled to. I want more than my share. I want so much money that I never have to look at my budget. I never have to look in my account before I buy something. And that is not the reality of my life, nor should it be. The reality is what I've been taught in AA is that money is for the exchange of goods. That Alcoholics Anonymous is my vocation. Anything else is what I happen to do for a living. But I didn't have that when I got here. And I'll be honest Money is probably the area that I struggle the most in. When I talk about my instincts going awry, I worry more about money than I worry about anything else. And then the last, um, the last form of security, that instinct that causes me trouble is emotional instincts. Um, that goes back to my need for attention. Uh, when I talk about the need for emotional security, it's not so much that I need you to make me feel okay. It's that I need you to think well of me. I want everyone to think well of me and think highly of me. And if you don't think well of me and think highly of me, I want to manage the way you see me. And it doesn't matter what I think about you. In fact, honestly, I don't like half of you, but I want you to love me, you know, and that's a problem, right? And when I say you, I don't mean you all in this meeting, present company excluded. It's them out there, right? They're the problem. But anyway, um, I just... You know, I'm always wanting people to love me. I want to manage the way everybody sees me. And what happens is I tend to um, not live within the values that I was given. Uh, I won't operate from my own value system because if it means you not liking me, I have to trade my values to get what I want. And that is for you to think well of me. So on page 44 in that same chapter in step four, it says, but that is not the only danger. Every time a person imposes his instincts unreasonably upon others, unhappiness follows. And the pursuit of wealth tramples upon people uh, who happen to be in the way, then anger, jealousy, and revenge are likely to be aroused. If sex sex runs riot, there is a similar uproar. Demands made upon other people for too much attention, protection, and love can only invite domination or revulsion in the protectors themselves. Two emotions quite as unhealthy as the demands which invoke them. When an individual's desire for prestige becomes uncontrollable, whether in the sewing circle or in the international conference table, other people will suffer and often revolt. This collision of instincts can produce anything from a cold snub to a blazing revolution. In these ways, we are set in conflict not only with ourselves, but with other people who have instincts too. So... 
I was about four or five years sober when I got caught up in a relationship with the opposite sex that I wouldn't care to have advertised. Uh, there were two things that I used to brag about when I came into AA, two things that I thought, two character defects that I thought had gone away the moment I put the drink down. One was um, being physically violent with other people. The other was um, getting involved with a person's spouse. And I can only brag about one of those now. Uh, at five years sober, I got involved with someone who was married. Uh, they were both members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had five years of sobriety. That person had uh, four more, four times the sobriety that I had. They had upward of 20 years. And we started talking to each other. And after some time, when I found out the individual was married, I got very upset. And I said to that person, how dare you um, even try to pursue me? I can't believe you would try to pursue me when you're in a marriage um, and the next words that I said to that person are pretty noteworthy looking back in retrospect. I said, what would it look like if I was dating you, knowing that you're married? See, I wasn't worried about the fact that they were married. I was worried about what you would think about me. And so I told that person, I never want to see you again. And to be honest with you, I was back at their house within 24 hours. Um, I didn't know what was going on at the time. My sponsor, who absolutely loved and adored me, said to me things like, they are married. How bad do you want to hurt? They are married. You need to respect their marriage and leave them alone. But when I talk about lack of power, I will tell you that at the time, if you'd asked me, why are you doing this? People love you in Alcoholics Anonymous. You value integrity. You value honesty. You want to be someone who is in concert with your fellows and you don't believe in hurting people. Why would you ever do something like this? I would tell you that I didn't know why I was doing it. I would tell you that every day I swore to God that I would not go over there one more day. If this was going to be the day I was going to break it off. And every single day I went back over there. And one day at a time, I continued to allow my values to be sliding scale in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was doing things. Things like going to conferences at the time, I was speaking all over um, all over the state of Texas, and people would come up to me after the meeting and they would say, "I love your talk. You've changed my life." And I would think to myself, "If you pat me on the back one more time, I'm going to die," because I knew I was living a double life amongst you. I would also leave that conference. I would um, take off the suit, I would put on my regular clothes, and I would go over to that individual's house, knowing that I was doing what I was doing. And so I will not go into the um, how that relationship ended. I will tell you that it was very detrimental, uh, very, very, um, very painful. Some really serious things happened. Um, and I have a burden that I will have to carry for the rest of my life. What happened to me at that time, and this is what's important to this talk, is that when that situation blew up, I cursed myself as a failure in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I decided that I had done something so terrible that my sobriety was broken. And I would go to meetings and I would listen to you people speak and I could no longer connect with what you were saying because I felt so spiritually disfigured at the time. What my disease told me at that time is you are the only one who has ever done something like this. You are the only one and you can't tell anybody about this. You can't tell anybody because if they know what you are, they'll ask you to leave. They don't want you in Alcoholics Anonymous. You have professed to be all these wonderful things. You speak all over the country now. Uh, you cannot tell people what you're doing. And so the disease is wonderful and classic in its way of keeping me in check. Because what the disease will tell me long before it ever tells me to take a drink is you are the only one that's suffering like this. Do not tell anybody what's going on. Once I start keeping secrets, the disease has me in lockdown. I am checkmated by the disease of alcoholism because once it can keep me from telling you the truth about myself, it will absolutely erode me from the inside out. Now, I never wanted to drink again, and I didn't want to die of untreated alcoholism, so I did what a woman like I do. Rather than taking the inventory to my sponsor, which would have been the right thing, because a business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. What I did instead is I proceeded to outrun alcoholism. I took every service commitment that you would give me in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was going to 7 to 10 meetings a week. I was sponsoring about 30 women. I was the I was the chairman of the pre-general service conference. I was the chairman of our local conference. I had a, a 
I was the alternate DCM for our district. I had uh, several home group commitments. I feel bad because nobody else got to take any service commitments because I was raising my hand for everything, right? Didn't nobody get any sober service commitments in my home group because I had them all. And what would happen is when I was working with a newcomer or when I was talking to the alcoholic who still suffered, it would calm the beast inside of me. But the moment I would walk away from the alcoholic who still suffered and I would go home and I would lock the door, I was no longer comfortable with who was living with me. It was painful. I spent 16 months in my sobriety out running alcoholism through what other people would think was a self-sacrificing member of Alcoholics Anonymous, someone who just loved AA so much I would take every service commitment under the sun. The truth was I was dying of untreated alcoholism. The truth was if you had asked me what I thought about myself, I would tell you that I was completely spiritually disfigured and unfit to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank God when I... um When I was about six years sober, I ended up moving to San Antonio, Texas. I sobered up in Kerrville, Texas, very small town AA. And I left and I moved into the big city, which is where I'm from. And when I moved into the big city, I got a new sponsor. And by the time I got that new sponsor, I was so arrogant. I was telling people in Alcoholics Anonymous how to live their life. Instincts gone awry. Because when I feel spiritually disfigured, I'm going to make you feel bad about your recovery. You know, I'm going to quote the big book inside and out. I'm going to share at you. And I'm going to tell you about how I don't, I can't believe you're even sober with the kind of program you work. I was firing people I sponsor because they weren't working the steps to the adequate speed that I wanted them to. I was a complete mess. And so when I went to my first, when I went to my new sponsor um, and asked her to be my sponsor, I remember her talking to me. She had been watching me in the rooms of AA, and she knew that I could quote the book, and she knew that I could do all these things, and I professed all these things in AA. And she said something that hit me right between the eyes one day. We were sitting down together, and she said, "It's amazing. You can quote the book. You probably know it better than anybody else I know." And I said, "Yeah, probably." And she said to me, "But you know what makes me sad is you certainly don't live it." She said, Stacy, my big book is three-dimensional in my life. If you want to know how well I know the big book, you should look at my feet. You should see my actions. She taught me things like the firing line is out there. That Alcoholics Anonymous is not what I'm doing right now in this moment, sitting in this meeting, talking to a bunch of drunks. Alcoholics Anonymous is what's going to happen when I turn this camera off and I go back to this office. If you want to know the AA that I have, you should talk to my colleagues. You should talk to the people who work for me. You should talk to my mother. Talk to my family. Ask them how Alcoholics Anonymous is working in my life. What I'm doing right here talking to you all is respite from Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the other 23 hours a day that matter. And so she asked me a beautiful question. She said, do you want to make AA three-dimensional in your life? And I completely, absolutely, wholeheartedly wanted to. Because I was getting to a point where I didn't believe that AA would keep working for me. That's how far devoid I was from taking the inventory to understand how one more time my instincts had gone awry and I had bought this delusion one more time that I could wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world. If only I managed, if only I satisfied my need for security and sex and money and material and the way that you see me, if only I could get all those things in check, I knew I was going to be okay. And one more time, I fell for this need for attention to the extent that I put myself in a compromise situation that not only hurt me, but it hurt several other people. I did do that inventory. It was one of the first assignments my sponsor asked me to do. And I remember us taking the third step in a labyrinth here in San Antonio and sitting down after that third step prayer and reading that inventory to her. And as I started reading the inventory of all the things that I had done, I couldn't stop crying. And I know for me, when I'm crying, that means surrender. When the tears come down, it means one more time I have completely surrendered and I have given up this idea that I can keep going, that I can keep managing, that I can keep running the show myself. And I said to her, I can't believe that I lived this way. Mind you, I am not drinking. I am five, six years away from a drink at this point in my life. And I have made decisions based on self, which hurt me and hurt people that I never intended to do. When we talk about being self-centered and we talk about being selfish, it's not that I'm all I think about. It's that all I think about is what I need, what I want, what I have to have to be okay. And when I am all I think about and I don't think well of myself at all, not meaning to, I'm going to hurt God's kids. 
And so I remember just having tears coming down and just being so angry and so sad and so hurt and so ashamed by my behavior. And I remember my sponsor saying to me, she said, you know, I've learned in the rooms of Al-Anon that you never take alcohol away from an alcoholic without a sufficient substitute. They may die. She said, it's clear to me that the behavior that you exhibited was because had you not have done it, you might have died. And I understood what she meant. Maybe I was going to be that person who was going to make that supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Maybe without exhibiting that behavior, that behavior would have always remained dormant and gone unchecked because I hadn't had the opportunity to really experience it and surrender it. What happened to me when I really looked at the honest inventory, and I'm so grateful that no one in my home group ever compared the sobriety that that person had to the sobriety that I had and decided that I was a victim, that I had been somehow 13th stepped in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, no, I was a very active participant in that behavior. What they did instead is they asked me, Stacy, what does someone like you have to believe about yourself to get in a situation like that? And it turned out through the inventory process, what I came to understand was this. I believe that you were a woman of dignity and grace because you had put the drink down. I would say to any newcomer woman in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, just because you put the drink down, you have dignity and grace. You don't have to earn it. You already have it. But the truth is, I never believed that for myself. I had often believed because of the business that I had worked in and because of the life that I had lived prior to Alcoholics Anonymous that um, I was somehow not as good as the rest of you. And I was undeserving completely. And I could not celebrate or wear white, if you will. And it turns out I had to put those old ideas out to pasture where they belong. Because when I carry old ideas like that, it's not so much that it hurts me, although it does. It will cause me to hurt you. Anything that stands in the way of me being of service to you and to God is a defect of character. I have to get it out of the way. And what are defects of character, really, but merely instincts that have gone awry? Because long before I will ever engage in defective behavior, I will decide that there is not enough for me. There's not enough money. There's not enough food. There's not enough sex. There's not enough attention. And now I'm going to move the target again. What I will tell you is as a result of doing that inventory and going all the way through to step nine and making amends to that family to the best of my ability, um, I walk a free woman today. There are many instances that I could have told you about. That's not the one time that my instincts went awry in sobriety, but it's the one that stands out the most. What I will tell you is I am a married woman today. In fact, uh, this past weekend, uh, my spouse and I celebrated uh, six years together. And that might not be a lot of time for you, but that's 42 years and dog years. So uh, for a girl like me, that's a long time to be married because every relationship I've ever been in, by the time I got to two and a half years sober, I would become emotionally unfaithful. That's what I do. That's how I show up. I get to the point where, you know, I notice that there is other people giving me attention and I'd like to kind of entertain that. I get into a fantasy world and I start, you know, being a little flirtatious and a little carousing, and I become emotionally unavailable in the relationship that I'm currently in. And that causes damage to the relationship. I have not done that since I've been in this marriage. And that is a far cry from who I was before I came here. I wish I would have come in with those kind of um, instincts. I wish I would have come in with that level of integrity. But because of what happened to me at six years sober, and I was willing to capitalize on the inventory process, there are certain values that I get to live within today that I could not live within prior to coming to you. I came in here with absolutely no values, no morals, no sense of community. I had to build all that here. So for anyone in here that's done something and you need to talk to somebody, call me. Chances are I've done what you've done. When in doubt, go to one more meeting. Do not allow the disease to convince you that you are the only one who is suffering the way you are. Do not allow the disease to tell you you are the only person who's ever done what you've done. There is scarcely any form of trouble that has not been overcome among us. So how do we fix these instincts gone awry? Step four through nine, regardless of how long you've been here. Have a good sponsor that has their hand on your pulse. Have a sponsor who you have no secrets with. Have a good sponsor who knows where all the the bodies are buried because in my experience, it is a matter of life and death. 
I've seen people die here from alcoholism with no alcohol in their system. I am fighting for my life. I'm fighting for my life because I understand that alcoholism can kill me in many different ways. And one of the ways it does it is through my instincts. My instincts must remain in check. Because the truth is, when I turn down the sound and I look at the picture, the reality is this. I have more money, time, and energy to do everything that God would have me do today. I don't need more than what I have. I don't need more than my share. What I really need to do, rather than looking at what I'm getting, I need to examine what I'm giving. Because when I think about the fact that if I help God's kids, he'll take care of me, it takes my mind off the idea of what I have. Because as long as I look at what I have, I'm always coming up short. I could always have more. Maybe another car. Maybe another romantic relationship. Maybe I could be a little skinnier. Maybe I could get more cosmetic surgery. I am getting older. But when I think about what I'm giving, under the belief that as long as I give, the more I give, the more I will receive. I am right-sized today. I'm in a place where spiritually I can reconcile my behavior. When my head hits the pillow at night, I don't have anything that I have to respond to, make amends for, um, clean up. Life is a little bit of all right. And you know, when I'm living that way, when I'm not hurting everybody in my life, I will tell you, not only do I sleep well, but my skin is comfortable. My ego is in check, and I remember that there is nothing about me that needs to be magnificent and special. What I need to do is allow a power greater than me to use me as a vessel so that magnificent things can take place around me. I've had the honor and privilege of being a part of many people's lives and being of service in so many capacities, and that's what I hope to continue to do. But I'm convinced that alcoholism will always, always Look for the area of my life that I'm not willing to stay to keep in check. And that's how it's going to get me. It will not get me through a bar. It will not get me through a celebration or the holidays. It's going to get me in one of my instincts. It's going to convince me that I don't have enough and that I need to pursue more. And if I do that long enough, I will come up thirsty here. So. I want to thank you all for the honor and privilege of being here and allowing me to speak. I do love your group, and uh, I'm going to keep coming back. Thank you for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.